What is the secret to unlocking your full potential? What makes your idols any different than you? How do you become the person you've always wanted to be in life? This is where you get all of your questions answered. My name is Justin Shank, and I sit down with some of the most epic individuals who are changing the world with their actions in business and in life. We discuss how they did it, why they pushed themselves, and more importantly, how they were able to focus on continuous growth to achieve their dreams. Welcome to the Growth Now Movement. This week, I sit down with my friend, Tom Singer. This week, Tom returns to the show, and if you guys don't realize, I've been having a lot of people back on a second time to the show. And the reason is, is because we don't stop growing. And I wanted to highlight some past guests to come on and talk about their growth and how they've shifted their life in the last year, two, three years, uh, in order to reach that next level, in order to get to that next goal. Because obviously we focus so much on that big story of overcoming the adversity to create the life that we want. But there's also lessons beyond that big aha moment. And with Tom, this is a lot of fun because he's doing something really cool with his life. If you can recall his first time on the show, he talked about how he wanted to make the ages from 50 to 75, the best 25 years of his life. And so he decided he was going to try things that scared him. He was going to try something new uh, to really stretch his comfort zone. And what he found was a new love, a new passion, and potentially a new career. So Tom started to go to some open mic nights and did stand-up comedy, uh, and he talks in this episode about what it's done for his speaking career, what it's doing for him personally, what it's doing in his personal life, and there's a ton of great topics in here that you guys are going to love with what we can learn from trying something new. Now, before we get to that episode, if you guys are loving this content, if you're loving Growth Now Movement, please click that subscribe button. Go ahead and give it a five-star rating and write a review on iTunes. That's how other people find out about the show, and we want to continue to spread this message of growth. Now, without further ado, let's get into the episode with my friend, Tom Singer. Tom, welcome back to the show, man. I am so thrilled. I don't think you have a lot of second time guests. I feel real honored. There's there's not too many, but I've gotten to the point now and, you know, being as many shows in as you are, like you get to a point now where like all of a sudden there's a completely different growth from where they've been on the show before. And so it's a completely different conversation, but still kind of in the realm of, of growth. Yes. And you and I were talking and I was like, I need to have you back on the show because your world has taken a completely different 180 turn, even though you still do the public speaking. Um, what you yeah. have voluntarily taken on board is kind of scary and crazy and fun. And so let's just start with, at the, how old are you now? 50, right? Uh, I'm 53. 53 years old. So at the age of 53, why would somebody go, you know what, I'm going to try this stand up thing? which is such a small percentage of the world in general. And then here you are, let me hop in. What, what is that all about? So I was 51. So it was about a year and four months ago. Uh, we have to back up to when I was 50. When I was 50, I made a commitment that I was going to make age 50 to 75 the best years of my life. And the truth is I had a good life before that. So this was, I mean, that's some work to be able to do it. And it meant I had to change myself a little. It meant I had to say yes to things that might've scared me. It meant I had to think out of the box. I had to become a little bit of a more adventurous person. And so I started saying yes to stuff. The first thing I did is I jumped off the Stratosphere Hotel. They have this thing called the Sky Jump in Las Vegas. It's 108 stories in the air and you're in a harness with a rope. And you leap off outside and you sort of free fall. And then they have tension ropes that make you land like you just are standing up. And I'm Crazy. scared of heights. Yeah. And so just that started it. But I've done all kinds of things the last three years. And a year and a half ago, I got invited by another professional speaker to go do open mic night, five minute comedy set at a comedy club in New York City. It was about a month before I was going to go to New York. He invited me, he said, come to open mic night with me. He's a professional comic. I thought he was inviting me to come watch him work on new material. Yeah. And he said, that's not what I'm inviting you to do. And I was like, no, like, no, <laughs> no, no. And he said, why not? Aren't you the guy who teaches try new things? Isn't your whole mantra about saying yes to stuff that scares you? And my thought was, God, I hate it when people throw my own teachings back in my face. But he was right. <laughs> yeah. And as a kid, I always wanted to be an actor or a comic. I mean, that was my dream was to be, you know, on, you know, a TV show or, or to be do stand up comedy. And I just never had the guts or the balls to do it. And so I thought, what the heck? And so for the first time ever, I did it at a comedy club in New York City in Greenwich Village. And it 
Seinfeld was not worried about job security. I was not good, <laughs> but, but, it, but it was interesting. So that's how it started. Yeah. I mean, you talk about the fear and then going on. And so you had how much actual planning did you do before you did it? You know, I, the week before I, I wasn't committed to, he'd asked me about a month out, but about a week out, I committed to do it. I put in a couple of hours and to be honest with you, right, I make my living as a professional speaker and I'm not a humorist, but there are parts of my speech where people laugh and mm-hmm. I, come from, I come from a big family. And so there's always some, some family stories I tell at a dinner party, you know, because my dad was 52 years old when I was born. And there's some funny things about growing up with an older dad. And I, I've always had some dinner party jokes. So I just took that stuff. And I met Drew, the, the comic who took me, an hour before. And I showed him what I was going to do. And he looked at me and goes, that's like cocktail party jokes and stage speech humor. That's exactly what it was. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yes. And he said, yes, yeah, stand-up is a different thing. So he, he took like 15 minutes and wrote a couple of actual punchlines to the scenarios that I had. And I worked those in, and that was where people laughed. I mean, I was like, how did he do that in three seconds? But, uh, but it was a start of something. And, and what I realized was it wasn't horrible. I wasn't the worst person in the room. There were professional comics there trying new things that mm. didn't work. So, I mean, there were 16 comics. I was probably eighth in the who was funny. But... I thought, it's you actually know, not bad at all. No, and, and, and the comics, so the funny part was well, one of the best comics in the room came up to me afterwards and said, was that really your first time doing stand-up? And I said, yes. And he said, God, you have amazing, amazing stage presence. And what I've learned since in the year and four months I've been doing it is that that's something that comedians work hard to get is this, this sense of being able to be on stage and be comfortable even mm. when they're not doing well. And because I've given... I don't know, 800, 900 professional corporate talks and trainings, I had at least some of that already. So it was a bonus I didn't know I had that like other, co- some of the comics were like, wow, you're, you're really comfortable up there. And then I was scared to tell them why. I just kind of said, well, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you didn't want to go into this huge spiel of like, well, here's why. It was yeah. more of like, you know, I'll, I'll, t- I'll take this, I'll accept that, that you know, because again, I mean, I've, I've had a number of stand-up comics on my show like Burt Kreischer and Drew Lynch and these people who do it for a living full time and they do very, very well financially, you know, and it's hard to be accepted in the comedy world. And we talked about that, you know? Oh, well, so that's, I mean, now you're getting into the interesting thing. So then I made the decision after coming back from New York, I I did an open mic night in my hometown of Austin just because I wanted my wife to see it. So I brought my wife and my 17 year old, she was 16 at the time and it was a disaster. (laughs) <laughs> uh, the, 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 the open mic night, uh, they had a lot of comics there. They reorged the list, didn't know who I was. So they put me last, had a small audience. By the time I went on at midnight, there were my wife, my daughter, and two other people, uh, you know, who were both comics who were drunk or high. And it was just, everything about it was horrible. Sure. And I decided I had such a good experience in New York. I don't want it to end here. So I made a commitment. I'm going to do a hundred open mic nights. I didn't even know how long it would take or what it would mean. I didn't know I was going to go once a week. But I just said that. And as I started going, and, and I, a couple weeks later, I was with you in San Diego, and there was a comedy club that had open mic night every night. And so I went every night. In fact, you came on the fourth night, but I went every night to the show. But I started realizing that no one would talk to me. And that hmm. was the weirdest thing, because in the corporate world, you know, I show up, I'm the speaker, people usually want to come and meet me. Um, you know, I look like I stepped out of Accountants Today magazine, so you put me in a business setting, I look like I'm you know, <laughs> auditing the whole place I belong. Uh, in the comedy club world, it was a whole flip for me, because most of the comics were young, uh, very, very ethnically diverse, which I, I think is great, but it was, you know, it's not like going to, you know, an accountant's Christmas party. Right. It, it was very... Uh, a lot of people with alternative lifestyles and, and really different backgrounds than maybe I had. And what I realized was is no one was talking to me because they were looking at me like, well, who brought their dad? <laughs> and, and so I found it very hard and very awkward because I'd like walk up and say hi and people would be almost rude. And I just wasn't used to that in a corporate type world. You know, I, I teach networking skills is one of the things I do. Yeah. Say hello to somebody. Most people politely engage with you whether they want to or not. And here I found that I was the outsider and it really took me a long time. It took me close to a year in Austin of showing up at five or six of the same open mic nights before some comics finally started to talk to me because I started to get better. That was the other thing is when you're new, you're no good. And they're like, whatever. Most people disappear before they start to get, you know, find their way. So yeah. So being accepted into that world 
it was really hard and really awkward. And yet in a way, it taught me so much about uh, 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 bias and privilege and uh, you know diversity and sort of being judged because now I was the person who was on the outside of the club. And it's actually, I think, made me a better person from having gone through this experience where people look at me and say, you don't belong here. Yeah. Well, you talked about how, you know, they didn't really approach you at first because you were like, so many people probably try it and then they don't keep showing up because they bomb. It's embarrassing. So wh- let's, let's talk about why you kept going because I don't, because somebody who has, has mastered the art of public speaking and, and something you had said to me really resonated with me. Um, I don't even know if it was on the, when I interviewed you or just a conversation we were having, we were talking about speaking and I was like, Hey, I want to speak more. And now that I am, you, you said to me, you know, Justin, everybody will say you did a good job. Nobody will ever walk up to you and be like, oh, you sucked, dude. But you know you do a good job when people wait in line to talk to you. And it was like three months after that was the first time I had like a line of people waiting to talk to me after I spoke. And it's been pretty consistent since then, um, including at PodFest where they were out the door, which was mind blowing to me. Um, but, But with that being said, like when you get to that point, it's easy to show up and keep showing up. Um, so what was it about this scenario where you're like, Hey, I'm just going to keep doing it. So, you know, that is, uh, you know, I was going to say that's really good advice, but I was the one who gave you the advice. So that sounds <laughs> that's really good advice for speakers. But, but the fact is, is that it's really, <laughs> I'm so fucking smart. But the, the fact <laughs> is, is that that's really true is that in the speaking world, it is true that nobody comes up and says, God, Justin, you were highly mediocre today. <laughs> and they just don't. We live in a polite society. So people usually, if they talk to the speaker at all, they come up and say, you know, oh, great speech, or I love that part about your sister. And speakers all tend to think, wow, I'm really good. But when you realize that it's the people lining up and it's the people saying, what else can you do for me? That's mm-hmm. when you know you've become a good speaker. Comedy is a whole different world because if you don't make them laugh, every, I've heard different numbers. Some say 15 seconds, some say 30 I like to say 30 because I'm nowhere near every 15. (laughs) But, you know, you've got a four-minute set sometimes at an open mic night. If you don't make them laugh eight times in that four minutes, then you know you were highly mediocre. And, you know, they don't talk to you. And so, you know, you have instant feedback. Whereas in an hour, sometimes people laugh, sometimes they lean in, sometimes they're checking your phone. You know, they can think you're the best speaker ever. They still might check their phone in 60 minutes because, you know, 2020, we can't not look at Facebook for an hour. That's me, by the way. (laughs) But in a comedy club, they're paying attention to you and you either, you either crush it or you're okay, or you bomb. There is, and the feedback is there as the, as the comedian. And so that has been the most interesting thing. I I did get asked to host a regular open mic night and I said, yes. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of a sign that I had paid my dues. I'd been around this company that produces comedy shows says, you know, do you want to, do you want to host this? And I said, yes. And we've done it one week. The second week is going to be this week, but I'm going to be out of town. So I have a guest host. I'm like, I'm the worst host ever. We can do that again. <laughs> but uh, it means it, you're that good that you can bring in a guest host week too. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. Well, you know, Tom is already out. Try, I'm out touring. Uh, <laughs> but what, what happened was though, is that the first night it was in a bar. And it was a big cavernous bar and it had a sound system. So the people who were organizing it were like, oh, this is so great. We don't have to bring in a PA and all this. Well, it turned out the sound system wasn't good enough for where we were. It wasn't loud enough. So I get up and kick off the show and people are like touching their ears like we can't hear. Now, I know how to use a microphone because I do this. So I'm like eating the mic, talking really loud. But then the first comic comes up and we can't hear him. And people are like, turn it up. Blah, blah. And it, it just, thankfully, there was no audience. There were 20 comics there. And interestingly, they all stayed. And I think part of the reason was it was such a train wreck. And then everything I had planned to do between comics was out the door because it was like, salvage this, keep it going, get the next comic out there. Nobody was laughing. Everybody, I mean, it was just painful. It It was literally really hard. The guy in charge had to run out to his car. It was blocks away, get his PA system, come in and try and hook it up. And we're switching around. I got home and I told my wife, I go, it was like being in a prize fight. It was horrible, (laughs) except I was thrilled that it happened to me because if I ever had a horrible experience like that, when someone was paying me as a speaker, that would be awful. That would be like refundable. But Mm. a free night hosting an open mic night in a bar with 20 comics and like four other people in the bar on a Wednesday night, it didn't matter. And I was able to just keep it going. And afterwards, some of the more established comics came up and said, my advice to you, they had some advice like how to be a better host because I'd never done it before. But their real advice was 
keep going. You, you did a really good job. You didn't look panicked. And they were like, keep this up. Keep hosting this mic because six months from now, you'll get better. And that's what I've learned both with being a speaker and now with my foot in the comic comedy world, you got to get the stage time. You got to get the reps. If you're not speaking, you know, 25 or more times a year, you're never going to get better because you're just not doing it enough. Same yeah. thing with comedy. I'm doing one open mic night a week. The guys who are re- and the women who are really making a career of this, but they haven't made it yet. They're doing 10 and 12 open mic nights a week and they're driving from one and they're driving across town to get, you know, three more minutes at the other one. Yeah. And that's what it really takes. It's I'm learning so much from these comedians that if you really want this as your career, and that's not what I'm pursuing, but if you really want it as your career, you got to do it. Yeah. And that's something that Drew Lynch, Drew Lynch had mentioned before too. Like he was doing it twice a, twice a day, um, every single day, twice a day. Cause he lives in LA. It makes it a little bit easier. You live in Austin. There's a couple options, but you know, it, it was one of those things where it does take that time and the consistency. So what is it about comedy that you still love now? Because look, like you've gotten to a point where you've gotten some applause, you've gotten laughter. I was really drunk, but I laughed. I don't quite remember all of it. Um, but when we look at that, like you're doing it good. So what's, why are you still doing it? Is there a goal? Well, I sort of said I want to do it 100 times. And so I've done like 65, 66 open mic nights. I've been invited to be a featured comic in three local shows. Now, wow. These aren't like, you know, this isn't like New York or, or Los Angeles big shows. These are shows on a Friday night in a bar, but they're paid shows. Like I've been paid to do it. Now, That's amazing. It was only like $10. I mean, we're not, we're not, you know, getting a new house off of two paid comedy shows. But, you know, I did take the, the first $10 I got and uh, someone took a picture of me and I framed it instead of spending it. And I, I actually put, you know, must be a professional comic in the frame. So that's uh, awesome. Got that hanging on the wall over there. But it's, uh, it is the reason I keep doing it is it's actually helping me in my speaking career. I am becoming a better speaker because of this. And I'm not doing comedy or more humor in my speeches. Although the areas where I already would get laughs are getting bigger laughs. But I'm learning, like, don't, don't step on those laughs. Let the laughs play themselves out. And so, therefore, the laughs are a little bigger. But the real thing, like, I had a client. I, I do a fair amount of Master of Ceremonies work for corporate events. And I've done this big, giant 3,000-person conference. This will be my third year. But last year was my second year. And afterwards, I mean, it was a great show. The, the person who produces the show did a great job. The meeting planner is probably the best meeting planner I've ever worked with. Everything was great. Uh, and the MC was fine, but, uh, they came, she came up to me afterwards and she said, you were fantastic. And I said, thank you. And she goes, I mean, I, I knew you were good cause I rehired you from last year, but you were better. She goes, why were you better? And I said, I think it has to be the stand up comedy. And she goes, well, you weren't out there doing comedy. She goes, I purposely don't hire comics. Yeah. As we can see, she goes, you weren't doing any comedy. And I said, no, but what it's done is it's made me more confident. And it's made me more playful with the audience. So they had a thing where there were some prizes I had to give out. Instead of just raise your hand, this and that, I like ran off the stage into the audience and I ran around. I don't know that I would have done that a year ago. And, and recently I was at another big association event and the speaker talked about breaking the rules of business. His name's Jason Katecki. He's written a book, There's so many number of bit rules we need to break in business. And when he finished... I was thinking, what can I do with that? What can I do? And right when he finished, I just kicked off my shoes and I ran on the stage. I thanked him. And then I let everybody see that I was just wearing socks. And I'm like, you know, I've been a master of ceremonies and speaker for 10 years. I thought it was a rule that I had to wear shoes on stage. I go, this is so freeing. And the the audience laughed. And then I took off my sports coat and I just flung it across the stage. And I said, who says the master of ceremonies has to wear a sports coat? And the audience laughed. And then I grabbed my belt and I undid my belt. And I just stood it and I stood there for like a three second count with my belt half undone. And then I tucked the tongue of the belt back in and I'm like, I bet pants are still a rule at this. (laughs) And it got a really big laugh and I never would have done that a year ago. So it's making me better at my job because I'm willing to be playful and I'm willing to kind of feel out what's going on with the audience. And I'm learning because I try to call back to the comic before me. I'm learning to pay more attention to what's happening before me at these places where I speak. So I, I tell everybody, I think the reason I'm doing it is, is it's making me a better person at my job and it's making me a better person. Yeah. That's amazing. Like, I, I love this whole entire try new things. I love this kind of mantra that you've put onto your life. 
where did that start? Like, why was it okay? I'm going to make, I know you said I'm going to make 50 to 75 the best years of your life. I understand that part, but a lot of people can do that without trying things that scare them. So what was like the embracing of that? And did you see it kind of ending this way or happening this way? Or did you envision something completely different? I don't know that I envisioned necessarily anything, but but part of my work that I do is is I when I work with company teams is I talk about what I call sort of this gap between potential and performance. And so in interviewing all of these corporate people and asking them about, you know, why do some people get stuck, right? They have a lot of potential, but but so what? Potential doesn't mean anything if we don't actually have actions and results. Right. So there's a gap between potential and performance, and I started interviewing people and interviewing the, the CEOs and, and people I have on my podcast, I added in a question a couple of years ago that said, why do you think some people get farther across the gap than others? And one of the answers that have come up in individual interviews and on my podcast was, I'm willing to try stuff. So like CEOs who've really made it said, you know, I failed three times or I started my business to do this and it was okay, but I couldn't scale it. So I tried this, didn't work. Tried that, didn't work. You know me for the fourth iteration of my business that became really big but if I was going to stick with my original idea, that's all I would have ever had. And it would have been a fine little business, but it never would have become what this is. So I interpreted that to try new things. And it just sort of became a mantra that really excited me because I learned something about myself through this sort of growth period, if you want to call it the last three years. I've been a person, Justin, who throughout my whole life tended, although I've been successful, I tended to only do things where I thought there would be some level of success. Hmm. So if it seemed hard or it seemed scary, or if I didn't see a path to where everybody go, wow, isn't Tom cool? I would find a reason to not go or say no or, or whatever. So I was a kid who, I wasn't very athletic. So I was never picked for sports and therefore I never did anything athletic for the, like the rest of my life. Cause I had a mindset that I wasn't a sports guy. Now I run 10 to 12 miles a week and I've lost 30 pounds and I can tell when I ran three miles this morning. Um, and that started when I was 50 was, Hey, maybe I could lose the weight. Maybe I could run a half marathon. Um, and so I did, you know, I, I just started saying yes to things that scare me. Not everything works out great. Uh, my wife and I went surfing. Uh, <laughs> be, I think it's closed now, but there used to be a, an inland surf park with like this giant machine that made pretty big waves. Oh yeah. yeah I've seen those. And, uh, they're one of the original ones was in Austin, Texas. And so last summer, my wife really wanted to go try it and we went and I had a shitty time. I really did not enjoy it. I got hit by a surfboard in the head. Uh, you know, I, I don't have really strong knees. So getting up was really hard. Uh, I ran over a kid almost and it kind of, <laughs> be the guy who did that. So we, we had paid for, I don't know, it was 60 or 90 minutes halfway through. I got out and my wife's like, why? And I'm like, I'm just not, I'm, I'm not liking it. And that's okay. I tried. I gave it a real good effort. She stayed the rest of the time. Now, the great thing for her was I was on the sidelines with a camera. So I was able to take video and stills of her. So she has great pictures of her time at the surf park and she liked it. Yeah. But she's also really tiny and she does yoga. And so she was able to do stuff that, you know, I, I was a little clunkier. But yeah. some of the things I tried, I, I don't like it. You know, that's okay. But my youngest daughter, she's really outdoorsy and I'm a city person. And so going back to when I was 50 and agreeing to try new things, she was like, can we please go to the Grand Canyon? Can we please go to Yosemite? And I'm like, you said Boston, right? Let's go to Boston. Boston would be an <laughs> awesome vacation. And so I kind of had to put my money where my mouth was. And now all of a sudden I've been doing outdoorsy hiking and camping things. And she is going to go to college in a year. When she finishes college, her lifelong plan is to hike the Appalachian Trail through. Wow. And that's thousands of miles. It's six months. You sleep in a tent on the ground. And I've agreed to go with her. And the whole so, way. The whole way. I've got five years till we go, but four and a half years till we go. But I have a countdown clock on my phone that says how long until I think it's April 1st, five years from now, yeah. uh, till we go. And every now and then I, I post a thing of how many days until I do this. But it, I'm, not, I'm not a camper. I, my whole life has been as a city kid. I grew up in Los Angeles. All my vacations have been like Paris, New York, Seattle, Chicago, you know, I love going to cities. I love, you know, wandering downtowns and yeah. I've agreed to do this because it's her passion. It's her dream. Part of me is like, do you really want a 22 year old girl doing it alone? Um, that's why my wife is like all my wife is like, this is awesome. It's not that she wants me gone for six months. Although that might be like a little bonus. You, that's what you're telling yourself, right? <laughs> <laughs> totally. 
But, uh, but the flip side of it is, is that, uh, you know, I, I will have this experience with my daughter. We're going to get matching when we finish, we'll get little matching tattoos of the Appalachian trail logo on our, on our ankles. That's cool. Uh, But that's not the person I was four years ago. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think any, anything we're, we're evolving. Right. So on a side note, I actually had a friend, um, who's since passed away, but he did the whole Appalachian trail and he left one person, came back a completely different person, not only physically as his beard was huge, his hair was long and he lost about 50 pounds. Um, but he, uh, was just a different person in general, how he approached life and ended up becoming like a wilderness instructor after that. Um, and it became, that became everything that he did. But, but yeah, I mean, you know, we, life is about evolution. It's about finding the next you. And I think that's something that we're constantly on, which is why I'm now in a part with the podcast where you will see people that are coming back on the show because it's been a year. And I think, and look at my life and I look at your life, how much it's changed in the last year. I look at Andre, who was just on a second time, how much his has changed in the last year. I think we can create evolution for ourselves really, really quickly. But the key is creating it. Um, So what would you say to somebody listening right now being like, I feel so far away from the big goal that I have in my head, how do I at least start to create the evolution of who I want to be? Well, I think the first thing is don't wait till you're 50. You know, (laughs) I, I, I mentor a lot of people. I have two, two guys who I mentor who we become so close. I call them my fake sons. My wife invites them for father's day. Uh, Jake's mom came to Austin to visit and he like had my wife and I go to dinner with her because I am like this father figure to this guy. And yeah, I tell him all the time, you know, don't get so caught up in, oh, I need to get the next job. I have to do the next thing that you lose sight of who you are. I spent 25 years with my ladder against the wrong wall because I felt that's what society needed to do. As a father and a husband, I needed to have the corporate job. I needed to do these things. And so my advice is don't wait till you're 50. I happen to have waited till I was 50. You know, you don't have to. You could say, I'm going to make every day the best days of my life. But if you want to evolve, find ways to say yes. You know, you can mix business with pleasure. Um, one of the things, so I really like this comedy scene that I've, I've gotten, gotten into. And there's a couple of young guys who have a company producing comedy, but they're both 25. They don't have business experience. Yeah. So I'm becoming their, I'm their vice president of corporate events because what, one of the things they want to do is help book clean comics into association events. And so I'm going to help, you know, them run that because I know how to get booked into association events. And we want to put on some training classes of how to use comedy to grow as a person, like maybe some weekend like courses type thing and how to grow as a business person. And so I'm going to be in charge of, of developing some of this material with them. And if it works, I'll get to share in the revenue. And so it's this great thing of being able to mix business with pleasure because I like the comedy stuff and I know about the speaking business, speaking and training business so we can work together. You know, if you have something in your life that you passionately want to do, is there a way that you can marry it with your, with your current job? Is there something mm. you can do that you bring in? And if not, is there a way that you can make it, make it its cousin so that you can, you know, do the thing that you're passionate about? and still be at work and not hate it every day? Is there a way to bring the two things together? So that's really, you know, my advice is you don't have to wait and you don't have to quit your job. There's ways to, to intermingle these things and be able to, if nothing else, find growth through the journey. Mm, I, I love that. And obviously that's a great example for what I've done with this podcast. I started on the side. I didn't, I couldn't quit my job. That was the re- reality. And, um, I then started to build this thing on the side that was business and passion all, all built into one. And then it granted me the opportunity to be able to do it full time, you know, after a certain amount of time. So I love that. And like, I can't wait to see where that evolves for you with that company. Cause number one, it sounds amazing. I think that it, I think it speaks to a whole new generation of individuals um, who don't understand mixing passion and business. They don't, they don't, they think it is one or the other. They don't know if they can bring in their comedy and what they love into what they're doing. And I'm excited to kind of see where that goes for you. But as far as your life and your passion and comedy, not the business part of it, but the actual stand up side of it, where do you see yourself a year, two, three years from now? You know, so I really, honest to God, I went into this thinking, I'm going to go do 100 open mic nights and see what I learned. I thought maybe I could write a speech called What I Learned from 100 Open Mic Nights. In fact, I just applied for South by Southwest for 2020, and the title of the speech is What I Learned from 100 Open Mic Nights, because I will be at 100 by the time we get to uh, March when South by Southwest will be. So that's I awesome. Kind of, I kind of thought that's what I was doing, is I'm just going to have the experience, and most of my training and, and my corporate consulting comes from experiences that I or other people have had. And I actually use you as an example when I speak, and I talk about the fact that, you know, here was this young guy, didn't know what he wanted to do, had this passion for podcasting, started a podcast, 
and then started a business helping other people start podcasts. And now he's making more money than he made in that job that he quit. And, you know, you're blowing up. And so you're an example of exactly what we're talking about in this whole thing. Uh, and I talk about you at companies. And then I tell him, by the way, if you're going to start a podcast, he's one of my two recommendations. Bam, call Justin. I um, appreciate that, obviously. But- yeah. <laughs> but, but the fact is, is that you, you found something you loved and then you said, how do I make money at it? So I have an older brother who's a musician and he wanted to be a saxophone player. That's what he wanted to do with his life. And he didn't make it as a professional saxophone player, but he loved the saxophone. He self-taught himself to play. He's a jazz musician. Saxophones are really ornate. And so my brother, 30 years ago, became New York's premier saxophone repairman. And mm. He still gets to play, but he gets to hold like these famous people's historical horns because they need to be soldered. They need to be adjusted. And so all these famous saxophone players and all these like high school players and bands come to my brother in New York to, you know, have their saxophones repaired. And he is the guy and he's, you know, in his sixties and he loves the saxophone and he makes a huge living repairing saxophones, clarinets, and flutes, because, you know, that's, that's the thing. So you and my brother, are the two stories I tell about find something you love. And then, and then maybe it's not making money doing that. It's making money over here, but you're still doing that, mixing that business with that pleasure. So, yeah. uh, but for back to your question, for me, I didn't go into it thinking, oh, I was ever going to be invited to be a featured comic in a show. Well, now I've done that three times. And one of the times I had like 40 friends come to watch me. And so that was scary to like bring all my worlds together in one room. Yeah. You know, well, I, you know, you know, I tell jokes, but I did okay. And people were like, it was funny because some of your friends are like, wow, I was surprised you were good. It's like, oh. <laughs> You've never been funny before, Tom. What are you doing? Well, it was like, you know, it's kind of one of those compliments. Like, what were you, why did you come? Were you coming to see me just bomb? <laughs> uh, so I don't know what the goal is now. Right. So there's a part of me that says I, I do the hundred open mic nights and I just, figure it out then. There's a part of me, because a lot of people say, well, you can't start comedy at 50 because it takes so long to get established. you know. And I thought, well, screw that. If I wanted a career in it, I could figure it out. Yeah. So there's part of me that says, what if I could really learn to write some of the stuff? And what if I could do it? What if I could come up with an hour of material? You know, could I be someone who you know, gets to go talk to Fallon and do five minutes? Could I get a Netflix special? Not today but maybe in four or five years. And I think there's a lesson in the fact that, look, I was 51 the first time I ever got up on a stage. And I think that there's a positive example, whether it's comedy or, you know, freaking photography or whatever it is. I think there's a message in it that I did this at 50. So I think I sort of have an obligation to myself and maybe to some other people that I have to keep pushing it forward, but I don't have that answer for you right now. Yeah. No, I love that. And if you ever get to a point where you're selling out arenas, I'll be the first one to buy a ticket to any of your shows. As long as you come close to me, I'm not traveling. You get so it. My, da- my daughter, who's <laughs> 22, her and her fiance came. I was in Pittsburgh and I found an open mic night near where we were having dinner. So after dinner, I invited them to come with me and it was a total seedy, smoky bar in Pittsburgh. My daughter doesn't like cigarette smoke and it was a lot of it, but she was a good sport. She didn't complain. And afterwards she said, that was the seediest bar I think I've ever been in. And I said, thanks for coming. And she goes, well, she goes, you actually didn't suck, you know, which was about as much of a compliment as your own kid's going to give you. And then she said, plus, I've come to see you do an open mic night. I don't have to do it again. And I said, Jackie, what if I get a Netflix special? (laughs) And she said, I will make a proclamation right now. If you get a Netflix special, I will come sit in the front row, even if the person next to me is smoking cigars. She goes, and I will sit right there. And her fiance goes, is that because you don't think it'll ever happen? And she goes, eh, we'll just leave it at that. If he ever gets it, I'll sit. In the front. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. And so I, I think that you, you know, should start. And I, we talked about this a little bit, but you should start interviewing some comics and kind of start to learn and, and continue to learn, I should say, because you're already learning. Um, but I'm excited to see where it goes for you. And um, this conversation has been a blast. It's, it's really cool to kind of see all the people that I get to call friends like yourself and Adam and, and all the people in our crew specifically um, to see everybody grow. Cause Adam's in this massive growth kind of trajectory and Rob's in one. And Adam came to an open mic night with me in Austin, Texas and got up and did a four minute comedy set. I saw at least part of it. I don't know if it was quite four minutes long, if I did see the whole thing. And I think I did, but I did laugh once or twice. I'll give him that. Uh, and so, but, if, uh, but I knew actually, cause it was funny cause him and I talked about it. And uh, I knew what he was going to kind of talk about. And so I was like, that's actually really funny. 
you know, but he got up and tried, right? And he's going to do it again. He had the same sort of experience. Okay, I did it once. Now, what, what can I, where can I take it from there? It was, he's going to push himself to, to fine tune it. But I thought it was funny because I said to you right after Adam did it, I said, oh, when I see, when we're, you know, next time we're together, you know, come with me and get up and do it. And you were so funny. You're like, nope. There wasn't even like, there wasn't even like a two second delay. Nope. <laughs> I will say this though. There, after seeing Adam's and how not so great he was, um, <laughs> I actually think I may do it. All right. All right. And well, so the, the night I saw his video, because he, he texted it to me, um, I actually said, you know what? I think I could do this. <laughs> it right, was like right, that, so, like nod. So you heard it. The, the entire Growth Now movement you know, audience just heard this, is that Justin is going to do open mic night with me the next time we're in the same city. Uh, and we, we can even, pl- we'll, we'll do this off the record, but we can plan a time too, because I want to come to Austin. I've been talking about it forever. Um, and part of what I'm doing now is not just traveling when I'm working. Um, it's really kind of a commitment to go travel and enjoy, which is why I'm going to Chicago in two days. Um, nice. well, we've got a guest room, so you can stay here. Perfect. It'll save you I cash. Love, I love free lodging. That's my favorite <laughs> part of travel is when someone's going to stay with me. It's the best, dude. Like collecting points and then staying for even staying on points is great. So anyway, um, obviously we've been here. We've done the five rapid fire questions. I asked you what your biggest moment of growth was. We've been through all of it. And so one thing that I'm really focused on now is how sometimes when we set an intention in our life and we focus on one thing or one word, um, we find that our purpose and our passion starts to kind of glide down that path. So my word is growth. And so I focus on growth. And since I've started to truly focus on that, it's be completely changed my life because I focus on that daily growth pattern of let's get better every single day. So my question for you is to wrap up this whole entire thing. What is your word of intention and how are you taking that to help your life go to the next level? You know, I think it's, I think it's more than one word, but I think it is this make 50 to 75 the best years of my life. I think if that was one word, that'd be bigger than supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. But I think (laughs) if I can use that as my intention instead of one word, I think the more I stay true to that, and I'm three years into it, I'm 53, the more I've stayed true to make 50 to 75 the best years of my life, the more I'm finding ways to say yes, the more I'm having experiences I might not have had, the more I'm meeting people who are extremely diverse. I mean, I don't even want to get into to, to that discussion because that's a whole other podcast, but I'm meeting people who are just so much different than, than me and that makes me a better person. So I think that uh, by just saying yes to experiences, uh, I'm, I'm winning and I'm growing. I love it. Tom, I appreciate you so much, as you know. I can't wait to come to Austin and I'll do an open mic. I'm already, ner- like, I'm literally already nervous about it. <laughs> I can see your, your, your listeners can't see it, but like when, when, I, when I made the proclamation, you nodded your head, but you nodded your head like, what have we just done? Uh, this, is, this is not good, but there, I'm sure there'll be a video out there somewhere of the mess that happens on that stage. But man, thank you so much. I appreciate coming back on the show and sharing your exciting adventures that you're jumping into now, man. This has been great. And I'm sure I'll have you on in another hundred episodes or something. Awesome. Thank you. Cool, man. Thanks. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the Growth Now movement. This is how you can really help me out. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that fun stuff. And let's grow this movement to epic heights. And it's all going to be because of you guys. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next week.